The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. The following lesson was presented at 1008 East Exchange Parkway, Allen, Texas, by William St. John on April 17, 2016. We hope you enjoy A Man to Stand in the Breach. In Acts, the 10th chapter, we read of a man by the name of Cornelius, and the Bible tells us there, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, and which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. This leader of a hundred men stands out in biblical history. He is unique and a wonderful example. Over in the book of Psalm, in Psalm 106, when the psalmist David is recounting the story of the people's rebellion and God's mercy, he said in Psalm 106 in verse 23, Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Overlooking my mistakes, the reading from Acts 10, 1 and 2, and from Psalm 106 and verse 23. In Genesis 1 and verse 28, when God created man and woman, he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. And so man was placed in the role of the head of the house. God is head over, the, over Christ. Christ is head over man. And man is head over the woman. A man and a woman establish their own home whenever they leave their mother and father and cleave to one another. And many problems are caused by not realizing this. What I'd like to notice for a short time this morning is the kind of fathers we need. And there are several notable examples of fathers in the Bible. I think of Father Abraham and others. But I want to notice in particular this man Cornelius this morning. This man of the Italian band. This devout man. This man who feared God with all his house. This man who gave much alms and prayed to God always. First of all, I want you to notice that Cornelius is a devout man. He is devoted. He was uniquely prepared to be the first Gentile con convert. He was used to following instructions, understanding orders, and so when he was told what to do, it was not a problem for him to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he is devout. He is faithful. And he is faithful to his family. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, Paul said, If any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. A person who does not provide for his family is worse than someone who denies God. He is worse than someone who does not even believe in God, an infidel. You see, the father is the breadwinner. He is the head of the household. Cornelius was a pious man who assumed his duties well. And may I say this morning, first and foremost, we need more fathers like him. The Jews that heard on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 were devoted Jews, devout. The soldier that Cornelius sent for Peter was not just any soldier, but a devout soldier, Acts 10 and 7. Other than this, the term is used very sparingly in the Word of God. It is applied to Simeon, the man at the temple when Jesus was presented there. The men who carried Stephen to their burial were said to be devout men. Ananias, the man who baptized the apostle Paul, who at that time was Saul, was a devout man. Other than that, they are few and far between references to devoted men. We need men who are devoted, who are devout, who are faithful. And that brings us to the second point about Cornelius. Cornelius feared God. We need fathers who know God, who know about honor and respect, and who honor God, who hold Him in awe, who fear God. In Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, Solomon said after his search for happiness, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 
Now you'll note that duty there is supplied. It's not in the Hebrew. But the idea of serving God is certainly a duty. But Cornelius was more than that. He was not just doing his duty out of rote. He feared God. He respected Him. And Solomon said that's what makes you whole. That's what completes you when you have respect for God and do His will. Keep His commandments. We need fathers who fear God, who respect Him, and will keep His commandments. Proverbs 1 and verse 7, he said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And again in Psalm 111, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So both knowledge and wisdom, the skill to apply it, both start right here when we respect God, when we fear Him. Much could be said about fearing God. It is a much needed element in the people's lives today. And where there is no fear of God, the people are given to evil. You remember Father Abraham said in Genesis 20 and verse 11, I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. They will slay me for my wife's sake. When men do not fear God, they seldom fear anything. In Proverbs 10 and 27, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. You and I must have fear of God. Not afraid of Him but a deep and abiding respect of Him, as it were, a fear of displeasing Him. You recall that God said that He is to be held in reverence in the assembly? Do you remember when that was spoken? It was when Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them their censer and offered strange fire before the Lord, which He commanded them not. They offered something which God had not authorized. God had not told him to do that. He'd not told them to use that kind of fire. Now, I don't know where they got it from that morning. I don't know if they got up late. I don't know if they weren't thinking. But I do know this. They died for it. And the reason was they did not reverence God. They did not respect Him. That offering was disrespectful because they did not do it the way He said to do it. Is our worship any different? We are to come before His presence with singing Psalm 100 and verse 2. God is to be held in reverence in the assembly and of all those who come to worship Him. Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We have airbags in our cars and seat belts because we fear being killed. We put locks on our houses because we fear what men can do. We put security systems out. We pray and ask God to watch over and care for us because we fear those who are able to kill the body. But much more than that. Jesus says when you compare that to the respect you have for God, we shouldn't even be afraid of them at all. That's how much greater our respect for God must be. We must hold Him in awe. We must be afraid of displeasing Him. We must respect Him. In Psalm 1 and verse 28, He said, Then shall they call upon Me, and I will not answer. They shall seek Me early, but they shall not find Me. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. As fathers, we need to know this. When we kneel to pray, if we do not have respect for God, He's not listening. He's not going to hear. He says that very plainly. I will not answer. We need fathers who respect God. Who have, have reverence for God. Then next I would consider with you that it didn't stop with Cornelius. His, fluent, his influence went over his family. He feared God with all of his house. And that's not just his sons and daughters if he had them. But that's everyone in his household. Everyone in Cornelius' house knew what Cornelius was about. Cornelius knew about obedience. He knew about leadership. He knew about example. And that's what we as fathers must understand. Cornelius led his family to God. In this respect, he's like Abraham, the father of the faithful. In Genesis 18 and 19, God said, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he had spoken of him. God said of Abraham, I know him. He will obey me, and he will teach his children, and those who follow after him, he will teach his children and his household to obey my commands. It was the obligation of the fathers, parents, 
both father and mother, but especially of the fathers under the law of Moses to educate the children. In Deuteronomy 6, in verses 5 through 9, he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Not just teach. Teach diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. What do you talk about in your house around the table? What do you talk about in the living room? Do you talk about God? When thou sittest down in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, talk about God. When thou liest down at night, talk about God. When thou risest up in the morning, talk about God. The idea here is not that we're just always talking about God, but that it's evident in our life at all times. That every aspect of our life is upon Him and doing His will. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. They'll be like a bracelet on our hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes constantly before us. Even he said, you'll write them on the posts of your house and on your gates. Our children are to see our respect, our fear of God. Take heed to thyself, God said, and keep thy soul diligently. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. Lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Now once husband and wife have joined in marriage, they've established their own home, no longer can mother and dad have the influence that they did. It's a separate home. They no longer rule over the children. However, they do have an influence. And when it comes to grandchildren, you especially have an interest. And you especially have an influence over them. When they see their parents looking to you with the respect they have, if that's the way they do it, and it certainly should be, then they realize this person is somebody special. This person is someone mother and dad respect, and they naturally will respect the grandparent. You have a tremendous influence over them. It doesn't stop just because your children have left and established their own home. You still can teach your children and your grandchildren. It is the obligation of the father to see that discipline and instruction is provided. In Ephesians 6 and 4 he said, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, the word parent is something we use more in English than in other languages. And fathers here actually includes both mother and father. And the idea is that we, but especially fathers, because he's the head of the household, are to teach our children. We are not to provoke them, but we're to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can't force your children to be faithful, but you can bring them up to be faithful. You can nurture them. You can admonish them. In Colossians 3 and 21, he said, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Nurture carries with it the idea of chastening. An admonition that of teaching. Solomon said, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Psalm 19 and verse 18. In 13 and 24 he said, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, and he, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Betimes is the idea of when it's proper, when it's fitting. In Proverbs 29 and 17 he said, Correct thy son and he shall give thee rest, yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Oh, you've probably seen that. Go over to visit someone's house and mother's been there all day with the young children and she's, her hair is disheveled and she looks like she's been run through the ringer. She's worn out. And you just say, looks like you've had a pretty hard day. Oh, it's the children. You know what God said? If you would chasten them properly, you'd get some rest. You don't have to run around after them constantly. You can teach them to sit down and behave themselves. One of the problems we have with young children sometime in the congregation when we assemble together and they want to be busy and running around everywhere, is that's what they do at home. They've never been taught at home, sit down here on the couch for 15 minutes and let's just sit here. We entertain our children. 
Here's a new toy. Watch this program. Listen to this. Go out and play. We need to teach them to sit still sometimes. You try that, you might find they can hardly sit still for three or four minutes. And then they go off to school and the teacher wonders how they're ever going to get them to sit down. Well, this is what Solomon said. Whip them when they need it. Now do it properly. Don't abuse them. But if you chasten your son, he'd give you rest. He'd be a delight unto your soul. Can you say as Joshua did his old, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? And one thing we as parents need to learn is to stop lying to our children. Now, I'd like to say not lie, but the fact of the matter is we need to stop lying. You ever see a parent say, now listen, if you do that one more time, I'm going to spank you. And they do it one more time. Now I told you not to do that. If you do it again, I'm going to spank you. And they do it again. Now this is the last time I'm telling you, stop that. And they do it again. You're lying to them. You told them you'd do that, and then you didn't do it. And then other times, we want to be like the fellow was with his dog. He said, my dog always obeys my commands. The man said, really? He said, yes, watch this. He said to the dog, sit. And the dog ran under the bed, and he said, or run under the bed. We tell our children something to do, and if they don't want to do it, well, we just change it around so they can have their way. We're teaching them something disastrous. Remember Cornelius was brought up in the army, not brought up, but that he'd been in the army. He had risen to the point that he is over a hundred men. He's a centurion. He knows about orders. He knows about obedience. That's what we need to teach our children. One man said, teach your children obedience and you can teach them anything. It is the obligation of the father and the parents to lead their children to worship. But where do we lead our children? Oftentimes we lead them in the wrong direction, don't we? I want to read a little poem to you. It's called Just Like His Dad. Well, what are you going to be, my boy, when you reach manhood's years? A doctor, a lawyer, an actor great, throngs moving to laughter and tears. But he shook his head as he gave reply in a serious way that he had. I don't think I'd care to be any of those. I want to be like my dad. He wants to be like his dad, you men. Did you ever think as you pause that the boy who watches your every move is building a set of laws? He's molding a life you're the model for, and whether it's good or bad depends on the kind of example set to the boy who'd be like his dad. Would you have him go everywhere you go and have him do just the things you do? See everything that your eyes behold and woo all the gods you woo. When you see the worship that shines in the eyes of your lovable little lad, could you rest content if he gets his wish and grows to be like his dad? Our children are following our example. Our children will mimic us. How many times have you seen a little boy trying to do exactly what you've done? Why do you think they love to play in your shoes and go clomping about the house? They're trying to be like you. Why do you think they like to dress up in dad's hat, mom's dress? They're trying to be like you. That little girl wants to be the image that you are. Why do you think she wants to put lipstick on and makeup and, and fix her hair? Because she wants to be like you. And that little boy wants to be like you. If you pick up a hammer, he wants to hammer. You saw something, he wants to saw. You're his example. You're her example. Be the best example that you can be. In Psalm 127 and verse 3, he said, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Sister Dovey Good, several years ago, gave me a little poem after I'd preached on parents and our obligation. It's called Sheep and Lambs. It was a sheep, not a lamb, that strayed in the parable Jesus told. A grown-up sheep that had gone away from the ninety and nine in the fold. Out in the meadow, out in the cold, twas a sheep the good shepherd sought. Back to the flock and into the fold, twas a sheep the good shepherd brought. And why for the sheep should we earnestly long and so earnestly hope and pray? Because there is danger if they go wrong, they will lead the young lambs astray. 
For the lambs will follow the sheep, you know, wherever the sheep may stray. If the sheep go wrong, it will not be long till the lambs are as wrong as they. So with the sheep we earnestly plead for the sake of the lambs today. If the lambs are lost, what a terrible cost some sheep will have to pay. One of the saddest things that I read was of a man who had sheep. And he had one sheep who was constantly getting out. He'd done everything he could to prevent her from getting out. And so one morning he went out, and with his killing knife, he slit her throat. It was all he could do. It wasn't because of her, he wasn't angry with her. But he knew that if he did not stop that, the others would follow. And then disaster would be the result. They needed the protection of the pen that they were in. And if she led the lambs and others out, the dogs would have their way with them. And so, sadly and tearfully, he had to kill her. Thankfully, God does not kill us as parents when we make such disasters concerning our children. We must save our children, brethren. Several years ago, Brother Wayne Fussell put out a little article in um, his Midway Messenger. And uh, one of the things that amazed me was the idea of saving the children. I clipped it out, saved it. It said, and it's concerning us. One congregation found that where both parents were faithful to the Lord, with an active interest in the Lord's work, 93% of the kids remained faithful. So if both mother and father are faithful, not just faithful, but they are actively interested and working in the church, helping the church, 93%. You can still lose one. But the odds are you won't. On the other hand, if only one of the parents was faithful and active, that figure dropped to 73. If one of you is not faithful, maybe you attend, but you're really not faithful, you will lose one in four children. That's sobering. Where the parents were what we call reasonably active in the Lord's church, they attend, but they're really not too engaged. 53%. If that's your attitude toward the church, you need to know you're going to lose half your children. They're not going to be interested in the church unless you are. They're going to be interested in what you do. But the shocker? In those cases where both parents had attended only infrequently, they were not regular in attendance, the percentage of their children who remained faithful dropped to 6%. That means if you have 20 children, one of them would be faithful. That's why you need to be faithful. You're setting an example for your children to follow. The next thing I notice about Cornelius, he not only feared, his ho- feared God with all his house, but he gave. You know, he taught his children about giving. He set the example for them how to give because he gave much alms to the people. Always. He knew about sacrifice as a centurion and he knew of the importance of helping others. He was interested in others. He was honest. That's one thing we need to teach our children to be honest. We need to teach our children the importance of being honest when it comes to money. And yes, we need to teach our children the importance of giving. You know, this has been brought home to me a few years, well, several years ago. When I was about eight or nine years old, somewhere close to that, There are a lot of things I don't remember about that time. We lived in San Antonio, but I'll never forget one Sunday morning when I came into the building, and at that time we were worshiping in air, didn't know any better, and I sat down beside Brother Tremble, the preacher, and he was writing a check out. And that check was for an enormous amount back then. I've never forgotten that. Do you realize what your children do when you give? They watch you. They watch how much that check is you write out. They watch you put money in the check. I've seen children that are so caught up in that and so instructed in that that don't you dare miss them or they'll start crying out loud because they didn't get to give their dollar. We need to teach our children to give. 
not just giving as the Lord commands us to do on the first day of the week, but to give to others. They need to see us helping others. They need to see us going and visiting others and helping them with their needs. We need fathers who are concerned about others and willing to give. You remember what Job said? I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. Job sought out anyone that needed help and helped them. It is not only our obligation to give to the Lord to see that the gospel is preached and the suffering of Christians is relieved, but it is our duty to visit the widows and fatherless in their afflictions. And then he tells us Cornelius prayed. He prayed to God always. He knew about submission. He knew about being committed. And he knew about talking to superiors. And he talked to God. There's a power in prayer. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, we're told, be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Lay them before Him. We need fathers today who can pray, and some cannot pray. Now, I'm not saying they don't have the ability. I'm saying they might as well save their breath to cool their soup because their prayer is not going to get any higher than that ceiling because they're not faithful to God. If God is going to hear our prayers, we have to be faithful. Listen to how, how Solomon put it. Psalm 28 and verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law... Even his prayer shall be abomination. When you turn away from hearing what God tells you to do, God hates to hear you pray. He's displeased with you. He's out of fellowship with you. But when you pray, he despises it. Do you want to be in a position where you can't talk to God? Then live faithful. In Job 9 and 31 the blind man said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he may heareth. They called him on the carpet. They wanted to know how he was healed. And he said, Well, we know. You know. God doesn't hear sinners. Jesus could not have healed me if he'd been a sinner. And then he tells us exactly who God will hear. A worshiper of God who does his will, him he heareth. Have you done his will this morning? Do you realize that you are to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. We hear God's word, and that produces faith in our heart. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We are to turn from our sins. Jesus said, whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father and his angels in heaven. Whosoever denies me, him will I deny before my Father and his angels in heaven. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not he that believeth is saved and ought to be baptized. Not he that repents will believe and be saved and ought to confess Christ and be baptized. Not he that believeth and confesses shall be saved. But he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We are moving in all of this in this direction, but it is not until we are baptized into Christ that we are saved. That's when we've done his will. And if you've not done that, he's not promised to hear you. Do you see the problem with men in the world today teaching all you have to do is pray the sinner's prayer? God has not promised to hear us until we obey him. Our prayer is abomination unto him. How then are we expected to pray and ask his forgiveness? Ah, but there is another case. The Bible tells us we are to repent of our sins. We're to confess our sins. And we're to pray and ask God to forgive us our sins. But the difference is, this is someone who's already done that. Yes, God will hear our prayer. And yes, God will forgive us of our sins when we turn from them and ask His forgiveness. But not if we're not in Christ. 
Not if we're not in his household. Not if we're not his child. Once we've been baptized into Christ, we're commanded to worship faithfully. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. That we're to sing and we're to pray. We're to give of our means upon the first day of the week. We're not to forsake the Lord's Supper and count it as though we're common or unclean or unimportant or unholy. We're to be here to commune every first day of the week. We're to hear God's word. And if we don't do that, he won't hear us. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. That's a sobering thought. The world needs godly homes, but in order to have godly homes, we need godly fathers. Cornelius was certainly an exceptional man, and he deserves the title of a devout man, and such a man was certainly hard to find. You know, there was a time in Jerusalem when Jeremiah said you couldn't find such a man. Matter of fact, he was told in Jeremiah 5 and 1, Run you to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in the broad place thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, then I will pardon him. God said he would forgive them. Diogenes was a cynic of ancient Greece, and he's the one that symbolized carrying a lantern about, because at one time he was carrying a lantern, and he was peering into different places as he was going about. And someone asked him, said, what are you looking for? And he would reply, a man, an honest man. God's looking for that kind of man. God would have spared the city of Jerusalem for one righteous man. One man with pure character can avert destruction. One man of holy person. Moses stood in the breach to turn aside God's wrath. Moses stood alone before God. To turn aside God's anger. God had said, I will destroy these people and make of you a great nation. And Moses pleaded with him. Phineas was such a man. When Israel sinned in Psalm 106 and verse 30, we're told, Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. In Ezekiel 13 and verse 5, he said, You've not gone up into the gaps. Neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. You see, a breach that he's talking about here is you would have a walled city. And men would attack that wall as much as they would the people in hopes of making a breach in it. A place that's broken. Broken in two so that they might enter. Just like a breech-loading gun, you break it in two that it might be Put the shells into it. So they break the wall in two so that men might rush into it. And God said, you didn't go make up the hedge. This is the most dangerous place in battle. Sometimes men would step into the gap. They would step into the broken part of the hedge. They would step into the breach and stand there and take the full brunt of the attack in order to save those who were behind. That's what Moses did. But it wasn't an enemy. It was God. It was God's anger. Moses stood up against God. And God said he'd kill who he'd kill and he'd save who he'd save. There's another time when the wrath of God was about to fall upon us. We needed someone to stand in the breach for us. We'd sinned against God as a nation, as a people. As everyone on earth, we'd sinned against God. And he had the right and would pour out every bit of his anger, every bit of his righteous anger and his wrath upon mankind. He would wipe us out. He would send us to hell forever to suffer for the evil we did. But someone stood in the breach. Jesus did. He became sin for us. He stood in the breach and the wrath of God was poured out upon him. Isaiah said, we thought that God was punishing him. In one sense, God was. He was punishing him with our sins. He made him bear our sins. Jesus stood there. He hung there on the cross and he took the full brunt of our sins and the wrath of God because of our sins. And he died for it. A sacrifice. That we might have life eternal. 
God today asks you to stand up. To stand in the breach. To make up the broken places, the gaps. If you're a father and you've not been doing what you ought to do, it's time for you to stand up. If you're a mother and you've not been setting the kind of example you ought to, it's time for you to stand up. And if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are at a guilty distance from God. And no matter what you think or what men have told you, God said, I won't hear you. And if you will obey him, he will forgive you.